Get this up on the board. What in the Syriax examination, when you question, would you think, okay, I'd better start looking at the thoracic outlet a little bit? Was there anything that triggered off that idea for you? Yes? Um, numbness that comes on after going to bed. Okay, so we could perhaps have this numbness or pain once the um, pressure had been relieved. And this is the release phenomenon. All right. Okay. Anything else? How about vascular changes in the upper limb? Perhaps swelling or something like this. So we perhaps should look at vascular changes. Because remember, although the arteries and the veins are coming through the thoracic outlet, we've also got things like the cephalic vein going back in through the clavipectoral fascia. All right? So, we could perhaps get vascular changes. We could perhaps get a complaint of numbness and aching related to postural changes, and particularly a forward slump or a forward head carriage or carrying heavy things in an arm. So, a numbness and aching with postural changes or with carrying. From my experience, the common group or the more people I see are a little bit more in terms of middle-aged women rather more than men. I, I can only think of one or two men, but I've had a few women that have been much younger than that in their 20s following motor vehicle accidents that they're sort of threatening them with, you know, first rib removal and goodness knows what. And so these are things that we should sort of think about. Right, so we've got this and part of the um, testing within Syriax is really to focus you on doing additional things. So we would look at this and we would find that there's no weakness particularly when we test out muscles, no change in um, sensation, although we might have some problems up here because the first rib and the first thoracic nerve root tends to come up and over the first rib. So we can sometimes get sort of symptoms on the first rib particularly, like a neural rather than a neurovascular first rib. But generally speaking, that's not the thing we find. So what do we do as far as testing is concerned? Are there any special tests now that Syriax would advocate, but not for everybody? Because he was very good and only do what's necessary. Yes. We do the ruse test to see if it brings on symptoms. Okay, so there are a number of tests that we can do to try and clarify what is happening to the pulses. Would you say that's reasonable? So, now, which one are we going to do, or are we going to do the whole lot? I believe that a good starting point would be to try and ask the patient, in what position does this cause the problem? So, And if there is a, a problem like this, then we could perhaps devise a test that would help. So, we've got the people that carry stuff. Syriax had a good little simple test for that. Then we have the people that um, seem to be forward and have a problem, but not particularly the group that complain when they take their arm above the head. This is the hyperabduction syndrome group, okay, that they have a problem. So the best test for that is Adson's test. And then we've got the hyperabduction group, which we just take it into hyperabduction. Who did you call that? Rue? That's somebody's name? Is it? Okay. Roos. Roos. Or hyperabduction position. Okay. So those would be things that we could perhaps think about. Now, the problem with all of those is the false positives 
that go on. If we took this group here and we looked, the radial nerve dis uh, gets obliterated in various positions and there does not seem to be any particular um, rhyme nor reason because people don't have symptoms to any great extent. There are lots of these tests and I guess when you see a lot of tests it's because people are trying to find the definitive test that is constantly positive and in cases where there's no problem it's constantly negative. We don't have that luxury unfortunately in this particular area. So that's a start that we've made there. Now what are the components of the thoracic outlet? We need the boundaries the length and the contents. All right, let me... Yes, sir. Oh, you're going to answer it. Great. No, I'm very pleased. Good. Go on. Okay. Stick with the first rib first of all, because that's where the structures are going to be first orientated. So we've got the first rib, all right? Then what? How about the anterior and posterior boundaries on the first rib? Which ones? And medial. Okay, so we've got the middle and the anterior scalenes and the first rib. Great. Then, the subclavian vessels are sort of coming out over the first rib and then they're going to go to the middle part of the thoracic outlet, which is first rib and clavicle. And, of course, a muscle like the subclavius. And then where the subclavian artery becomes the axillary artery, where is that in relationship? You're on a roll. You've got to take your exam. <sighs> okay. And here we've got what we could call the coracoid pectoral area and the clavipectoral fascia. And so we've got now the axillary artery going below the coracoid process and behind pectoralis minor. Great, wonderful. Okay, we've got, uh, let me get a spine. Uh, sorry, uh, with the with the ribs on. There's a very good little book called Tunnel Syndromes. Very expensive, like a hundred bucks for a little book like this. But where else would you get the information from? I don't know. I've never heard of some of these tunnel syndromes that I sort of went on doing. But very good little diagrams. So Cliff Fowler has one, and I couldn't let him have one, and me not have, because he kept calling me up and saying, have you found a case of this tunnel syndrome? I didn't know what it was. <laughs> I found six this week. <laughs> okay, so here we've got this coming up like this. So there we've got the first part, which is the scalenes and the first um, rib here. Then the next part is, as it comes across here like this, we've got the clavicle coming around here. So this is traversing the middle part between the clavicle and the back, or the back of the clavicle and the first rib. And so we can see that when we look at the clavicle, we've got that anterior convexity there, which gives a bit of space, but if anything happens to that, like a fracture, and alters that slight movement, or we've got any of these rotational problems, which drop it down in anterior rotation, that space there gets less. Or if we've got any abnormality of the first rib being pulled up, that space gets less. And so the middle part is the clavicle first rib, and of course the subclavius muscle which is lying between them. Then we come to the next part, which is where the subclavian artery becomes the axillary artery, and it's going behind the coracoid, or below the coracoid, but behind pectoralis minor. And then it gets into the arm. And so if the pectoralis minor is in a state of high tension or whatever, or we alter what's happening in the whole of the scapula through hypotonus or whatever, then that's going to alter that angle as it goes underneath the pectoralis minor, deep to the pectoralis minor. So that's where it's kind of threatened. Can you show where the clavopectoral fascia 
The clavipectoral fascia is coming up surrounding the um, pectoralis minor, then it goes across as a single band and then it splits and it goes round each side of the subclavius. So we've got this sort of fascia just surrounding these in envelopes, all of these structures. So that will be coming across here, the clavipectoral fascia. Um, we've got the second, third and fourth or the third, fourth, and fifth um, ribs where the pectoralis minor is coming from and coming up here. And then the clavipectoral fascia is coming around here, across here and as a single band, and then splitting again and going around the subclavius muscle. So, we have a number of sort of possibilities here. First possibility is from an article I got from Overton in about, well, I didn't get from him, but an article written by Overton in 1967 on differential diagnosis of arm pain in um, clinical um, things of North America, research of North America, and I kind of wasn't aware of this, and I, I, I liked it. Here we've got the normal situation of the first part of the um, thoracic outlet at birth. And you can see that the angle of the first rib is fairly well just to the lower part of the body perhaps of T1. But then in males and females something different happens. Another thing where we're different. Okay? In the males this descends so that now we've got this at about the lower part of the or upper part of the body of uh, lower part of the body of two, and you can see that as this descends and comes down here, the distance between the middle and the anterior scalenes is going to be reduced. But in the female, it goes down even further and reduces that even more, the distance between the middle and the anterior scalene muscles. Now then, if we have the a little bit more of sort of um, getting into middle age and losing your posture and letting your head come forward and perhaps in um, women that have rather heavier breasts which pull down at the front here then that weight and so forth is going to make that even more of a threatened area. Somewhere, that'll have to do as a diagram for this area, okay? Um, now, the next thing we should look at is the middle part. Now, I, I don't quite follow this picture totally, but here we've got it coming through the second or the third part of the artery, because this thing here is the pectoralis minor that we've got it going through here. And this is part of what they're calling the hyperabduction syndrome as well. But we could trace out it, the clavicle here. I just wanted to get this bit. This diagram will have to do for this part here. That if anything happens to the curve of the clavicle or anything happens to the first rib that's coming around here, we can get all kinds of problems at that point there, at the middle part. Generally speaking, apart from being able to mobilize the clavicle or perhaps encourage some posterior rotation so we lift the clavicle, there's not much we can do here. And the ones I've ever seen where I thought it was this have had fractures and things, so there's not really much you can do about that. Now, when we come into the third part here, this is related to what's called the hyperabduction syndrome. These are the people where the ruse test would work, presumably, and this is from that book I spoke to you about. This is one of the diagrams, as we can see. And here is the pectoralis minor. There is the coracoid. And we get people now that get this pain when they go and put their arms above the head here, like this. Anybody here do this? Nobody gets this overwhelming thing at night that you've got to put your arm up like this. You can feel yourself doing this. I do this, and sometimes I do this. And when I do this with one arm, and especially when I do it with two arms, I get apnea, and I stop breathing for like 50 seconds at a time. And I wake up then, <coughs> like this. 
I think it must be a death wish. Because I can feel him putting it up and I know what he does to me. And yet I can feel I've got to get up there. <laughs> <laughs> Jim Meadows also had this and he went for apnea testing. He'll tell you about this, absolutely incredible. So he goes and he has it tested and they tell him that it, he's having an hour and a half sleep a night, effective sleep. So that's why he's tired all the time. So, so I, I say, okay, well, what happened, Jim? So they give him this positive pressure thing that blows air in and out at night. <laughs> and you're supposed to be able to sleep with this on. So he decided he didn't like this. So he went and had surgery that kind of reamed out the whole of the back of his pharynx. <laughs> I'm listening to this and think, oh, God, I think I'm going to put some little elastics on my arm <laughs> to hold my arms down. <laughs> but, but I don't know why we do this, but there are patients that work like this, of course, you know, um, particularly people like electricians, drywallers that do ceilings, painters are working in this position and producing that kind of a problem. Now, if there's got some problems here and that movement is not sufficient, or if this is very tight, or the clavipectoral fascia, because this of course would be the subclavius muscle, and this is coming around here and tight across here, any of those things are going to make a difference to this whole business. So we could perhaps look and see whether there's any stretching or anything like this that we could do. So, as far as we'd be concerned, we'd have to take into consideration a number of things, wouldn't we? The uh, position of the clavicle, can we make a difference to it? Certainly the position of the first rib, and certainly the scalenes, because we can make a difference to those. We can stretch the scalenes. We can inhibit the scalenes. We can move the first rib. Okay? We can actually move the clavicle a little bit, and, and Earl has sort of developed all those things of rotational stuff, which I must say I don't understand too clearly, so I would be very um, foolish to try and teach you those, wouldn't I? When I don't understand them fully myself. Okay? So, we can do sort of certain rotational moments, and you could make up any of these, for goodness sake. You could just work yourself out a thing and say, when does the clavicle posteriorly rotate? Well, it posteriorly rotates, certainly when you take your arm up to the side and when you abduct. I've had a difficulty with saying, okay, now if we do isometric activity of the muscles that produce an anterior rotation, they actually will produce a posterior rotation when they're working in a reversed action isometrically. I just haven't been able to prove that or reconcile it in my mind, so I just accept that they've perhaps got a good thing, but I haven't seen the light yet as far as that's concerned. Now then, if we have a look at those, and we could also sort of say to ourselves, we can make a difference also to the tension of the pectoralis minor. And we should check out that the um, sternoclavicular joint and the AC joint are moving to allow the clavicle to do its thing. And all of this with the coracoid, we should be looking a little bit perhaps at the position and the tension of the structures that hold the scapula. And so that's where I think we are. So for now, what I'd like to do is to just have a look at the tests that we've got on the board, the Syriax test, the, um, hyper, uh, the um, AdSense test, and the ruse test. And then we should just have a look at the first rib and how do we mobilize the first rib. Now, are you going to stop me when I'm in full flight? Okay. No. Yes. Please, go on, ask it. About the release phenomenon, why uh, they have pain with release, but you also say with the um, carrying or postural changes they have pain or numbness. I think they have numbness there more. I think this is not so much numbness with release. I put that down because you said it. It's more like we have pain, and it's the same phenomenon as if, I believe, if you kind of fall asleep on your leg and it's numb, you think, oh God, what's happened here? The circulation's gone, and then you sort of, and it's absolute agony when the circulation's trying to work its way back, whatever the physiology of that. I think that's what happens there. So you think pain more with... Yes, I think it's more, uh, the, the release phenomenon is kind of like pain. Is that what you understand then? Yeah. Um, about what the release phenomenon is. And it's similar, the, the analogy I think is if you fall asleep on, on your leg or something and then the blood goes back and, you think, <laughs> and you're glad, glad when it normalizes itself. So I don't know what the pain is there, whether it's some way that we can trigger off all these 
um, responses when the blood flow goes back, um, you know, and perhaps the nerves start working again or whatever. So theoretically, if someone has numbness with carrying, if they put the object down, they should have pain. I think no, I don't, yeah. I think then it's like a transient thing, but I think if they've got numbness all day and then they go to bed at night and then they sort of um, release, then that's when you get some, tend to more pain. Otherwise, this tends to not be long enough. They know and they just don't do it anymore. That's my observations on the ones I've seen with this. Let me just add uh, just one other thing before we go to back to the beds here, and it's this that. And this is a little bit of a, a devil's advocate thing again. When we were looking at the ribs and the articulation at the transverse process, we saw that for the second rib and right the way down to about the sixth, that we'd got this arrangement on the transverse process. Would you agree? It was like a backward and forward movement. And then when we got lower down, it was coming much more that kind of angle on the top part, lateral part. The first rib is kind of like on the under lateral part. So we've got like a whole thing like this. And this rib here is definitely facing a little downwards and a little forward. That's the facet on the transverse process. So we have a number of exceptions with the first rib. It only articulates with a single vertebra. But it's, and it hasn't got, as far as I can recall now, a superior costotransverse ligament going to the transverse process of C7. I'll have to look that up again. I, meant, I thought about that the other day, and I thought, I'd better look that up, and I forgot. So perhaps you could look it up. But it does have the lateral ligament, the lastocostotransverse, the one, those, deep, those quite thick fibers between the transverse process and the neck. And of course, it also has a capsule, and it also has the ligament um, on the first rib that goes to the bone. So it's well a consideration. So when people are kind of talking, oh wow, look at this, half an inch up. How can that take place? Because it's facing, it, its articulation is like this. What's happened to it? Has it come up here somehow? I don't know. You know, so I think we have to look at that. But it means that when we're restoring motion, we're always going to be restoring it in a anterior caudal direction. And I don't know that this, I think this joint manipulates well. I think it's far better mobilized. I know my friends manipulate me, and I always think that it's in the lower part of the cervical spine that they've done it. I never feel that they've got the same sort of um, specificity of that, like that second rib. You know that is a single little movement. I often find that like, like about 15 cracks or something when they use the lower part of the neck as the lever. So I, I think with the muscles, the big muscles that attach to this, um, that a lot of the time, mobilizing is a better bet, and I've gone to almost exclusively mobilizing this. I mean, occasionally give it a little poke, but um, mostly it's a mobilizing procedure. Hmm. Let's go to the beds. And let's have a look at the three tests.